Funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. President Joe Biden is expected to sign the infrastructure bill any day now, and that means billions of dollars will be heading to New Jersey. Good evening, and thank you for joining us here on NJ Spotlight News. I'm Leah Mishkin, in for Brianna Venosi. Well, among the changes you'll see, improvements to highways, transit, deficient bridges, money to build electric vehicle charging stations, the expansion of high-speed internet, and the list goes on. There's also a pool of money that could be used to fund the Gateway Project. But when will New Jersey start seeing those improvements? Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan dives into the numbers and the overall plan. New Jersey rail riders fed up with chronic delays caused by crumbling Hudson tunnels, failing Amtrak signals and general decrepitude can finally see light at the end of the political tunnel and the Gateway Project back on a fast track with billions that will flow from the historic bipartisan infrastructure bill. It wouldn't be unfair to compare it to the New Deal um, in some ways. We just haven't made a investment in our infrastructure like this for, for generations. Brian Fritch with the Build Gateway Coalition says Jersey will be able to tap into $8 billion over five years, money to help advance the Hudson River Tunnel Project. Amtrak will get $24 billion for Northeast Corridor improvements. It was an unprecedented investment in Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. Uh, that, that was included in the infrastructure bill. So we should see improvements, you know, from Trenton up, up to New York City um, and much smoother uh, rides over Amtrak property, including all the elements of the Gateway program uh, and the Hudson Tunnel project. The biggest piece here is that it, it can get us to a place where we can actually get full funding and fully start, right? Because you cannot finish <laughs> unless you've started. Major infrastructure pro projects need major federal dollars, right, to partner with localities so that you can really overhaul uh, uh, the infrastructure that we're still relying on from the 19th century. The Gateway Program, Steve Sigmund says the Portal North Bridge will lead off the massive multi-part project in August 2023. Governor Murphy called the infrastructure bill a game changer. Gateway aside, there is more than $12 billion that New Jersey is now set to receive to give our state the safe, modern, and reliable infrastructure our economic future demands. Every single member of our Congressional House delegation on both sides of the aisle voted for these critical investments. Murphy noted the infrastructure bill includes $4.2 billion to unlock NJ Transit's unfunded capital projects like refurbishing Newark Penn Station, replacing old rolling stock, and buying a fleet of electric buses, greener technology. They will be quiet, they will be clean, they will have better air all around um, in the communities that have buses going through them. The electrification of the fleet will be a massive improvement. There's so much that's good for Jersey um, that's going to make people's lives better. Congressman Josh Gottheimer points to other items in the bill. $104 million to build electric vehicle charging stations across the state, a billion dollars to replace lead lines that contaminate drinking water, and $100 million to expand high-speed internet. He says Jersey's Department of Transportation will get $8 billion to upgrade treacherous highways booby-trapped with potholes and repair or replace its more than 500 deficient bridges like these over Route 4 in Teaneck. I was in Teaneck a couple months ago looking again at this bridge that's literally falling apart. It's crumbling. Uh, and something I looked at when I ran as well. It's still not fixed. So we needed the resources. So, you know, we waited more than three decades for this. It's a once in a century bipartisan infrastructure bill. Gottheimer admits voters were frustrated last week after political jousting in Congress slowed the infrastructure bill's passage until after the election. Negotiations between progressives and Gottheimer's moderate caucus continue on President Biden's Build Back Better bill. 
Gottheimer pushed to delay a vote pending data from the Congressional Budget Office. It's the right move to say you want to get information, all the information, and read then have the time to read through the legislation and make sure nothing, there were no surprises added into it um, before moving forward. Based on what I've been told by the initial uh, feedback from White House and Treasury, we should be fine uh, and, be, and be ready to proceed. He expects a vote later this month. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Money from the massive federal infrastructure package is also on the way to one of the oldest ports on the coast, the Salem Marine Terminal. U.S. Senator Bob Menendez announced a $9 million federal grant for the South Jersey Port Corporation. They're in charge of running the Port of Salem. The money from the U.S. Department of Transportation will allow for the expansion of the port's capacity and to help prepare the facility to serve the region's surging offshore wind industry. The goal is to make South Jersey the nation's offshore wind energy capital. But for the wind port to succeed, it will need to be able to ship and deliver wind turbine components and related equipment up and down the Delaware and through to the Atlantic Ocean. The potential for the Port of Salem to take on millions of dollars in new business is tremendous. But when opportunity comes knocking, you have to be there to open the door. Over to Washington, where more subpoenas were issued by the Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection, the day the U.S. Capitol was stormed. Among the names is Bill Stepien, a former President Trump campaign manager and former campaign manager for Governor Chris Christie when he became embroiled in the Bridgegate scandal. No word yet on if he will appear before the committee. Former President Trump is fighting the investigation in court. Meanwhile, Governor Murphy signed 52 bills into law on Monday, including a ban on cosmetics that have been tested on animals, a new requirement to add the suicide prevention hotline number to student IDs in grades 7 through 12, and a bill that will allow you to use electronic vehicle registration. The governor also conditionally vetoed 26 bills. On that list is a bill that sparked debate while making its way through the legislature. It would allow police officers to review body-worn camera footage before writing their report on what happened at a scene. As correspondent Melissa Cooper explains, some oppose the idea because they say it allows officers to potentially omit information that doesn't appear on camera. There should never be an instance where an officer is reviewing footage and then writing um, one statement. Sarah Fajardo was the policy director for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey. Fajardo believes police officers wearing body cameras can help shed light on interactions with civilians, but she doesn't think law enforcement should be allowed to see the footage before giving their account of what happened during a routine traffic stop. It undermines civil rights. It undermines best practices for policing that are research-backed. There's science out there that tells us how memory operates. Um, and once you introduce new information into one's memory, it changes, right? We're, we're intelligent and sensitive people that, you know, receive more information and then incorporate it into our memories. And this gives undue power to the police and it really weakens the use of officer recollections in court. A bill that would allow officers to review body camera footage was on the governor's desk, but now it's on hold and civil rights advocates are thankful. Governor Murphy issuing a conditional veto on the measure along with several recommendations. The governor suggesting lawmakers amend the bill to exclude officers from being able to see the footage first if an officer uses force, discharges a firearm or uses deadly force, a person dies while in custody, and in situations where an officer will be the subject of a citizen or internal review complaint. For me, one of the most important pieces was eliminating this language about routine police stops because the original bill had a um, an exclusion for what they called routine police stops, meaning officers would be allowed to look at their camera footage during routine police stops, but there was no definition in the bill about what a routine police stop is, and none of the union members who were testifying in support of this bill could explain what a routine stop is. Sponsors of the bill have argued allowing officers to review body camera footage is crucial to providing a more accurate retelling of an event. Opponents say it does the opposite. In terms of people who are going to be most impacted by this, um, I do think that it's within our criminal legal system. The answer is always going to be people who are black and brown. And I say that because of 
this street level stop because of the constitutional issues around when an officer is stopping someone on the street. And like I said, that to me was the biggest, um, the biggest thing that I would have liked to have seen make it through in this bill is the inability of an officer to watch their video camera footage when they, they, when they have said that they have stopped someone because they were suspicious. Because we all know the numbers, we all know what's going on, we've all seen the state trooper, the New Jersey state trooper racial profiling data in the state, and all the work the Sentencing Commission is doing to lower mandatory minimum sentences for people because we see that it is black and brown people who are being impacted by that. While Governor Murphy made recommendations to the bill, he agrees there are certain times when police officers should be allowed to review body camera footage. The governor saying they're, quote, objective accountings of an incident or encounter and can serve as tools to enhance trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. My concern is that if they're allowed to watch their videotape before they're writing the report, we will forever lose the ability Ability to know whether their reasonable suspicion was based on what was actually going in their mind at the time that they made the stop versus what they saw because they saw it on a videotape. Um, and that's that's a constitutional issue. The conditional veto also recommends the bill require police officers to acknowledge they've reviewed the body camera footage. We reached out to the New Jersey State Policemen's Benevolent Association and the New Jersey Fraternal Order of Police for comment and are awaiting a response. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. Well, there's also a lot of controversy when it comes to whether or not students should be forced to wear masks in school. The governor of Pennsylvania recently announced he will lift his state mandate on January 17. It will then be up to local officials, he says, to decide. In New York, Mayor-elect Eric Adams also said he supports doing away with masks in schools before the end of the academic year. So what about New Jersey? As the state reports today, more than 6 million people are fully vaccinated. NJ Spotlight News health reporter Lilo Stainton joins us with the latest. Lilo, thanks for being with us. So Governor Murphy said on Monday if more students get vaccinated, the school mask mandate could come to an end. So where does New Jersey stand right now for that age group and does he have a target number in mind? Hey, Leah. Um, well, he does not have a target number in mind, um, but, you know, we're doing fairly well, um, I would say, on 12 to 17 year olds, right? There's about 650,000 kids in that group, um, and that group was approved by Pfizer in May to start getting vaccinated. So far, more than 400,000 of those are done, or about 400,000, so it's over two-thirds of that group. Um, Commissioner, Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli has said, um, you know, that she would she would really like it to be, you know, 70 percent, 75, 80 percent, even higher. You know, the more the better. Um, but you know, there's at least 260,000 folks, kids in that group still outstanding. When you come to the younger kids, the five to 11 age group, which of course was just approved last week. Um, only about 9,100 have been vaccinated. And that's a bigger group. There's 70, 760,000 children in that age group in New Jersey. So that's, you know, we've only done 1.2%. So we have a long way to go. But as you mentioned at the beginning, um, long way to go until what Murphy, the governor didn't really give us a specific on what is enough to possibly lift the mask mandate. Did the governor address that at all, those concerns from people who might think this is just a plot to get more students vaccinated? Right. Well, I mean, you know, the state would argue it was always following CDC guidance, which I believe it was on some level. Um, I think, you know, Murphy was asked directly yesterday if he was just twisting the arms of parents, and he said, no, these are just facts. Um, so, you know, the way they see it and, and the way the science suggests and it very clearly is, you know, when it's sort of public health basics 101, the more people you get vaccinated, the less places the, the virus has to go, the less chance it has to mutate, which is better for everybody vaccinated and unvaccinated. And, you know, it's important to remember that while children aren't, you know, haven't borne the bulk of the, the burden with this disease, you know, uh, we, a lot of them, more than a thousand have been hospitalized. Um, you know, eight have died. Um, it's, you know, it is having an impact on children. Um, and that, of course, has impacts on families that are huge. So, um, you know, 
the governor would argue it matters to get vaccinated for whatever reason. Right. And, and is there a timeline on this or he didn't mention that yet? No timeline, but I will note that the um, that the mandate the governor pointed out yesterday um, would expire anyway on January in the middle of January. I think it was the 19th or the 11th. So the point is he, he made a point of saying we would have to proactively take a step in order to re-up it. And so they, it sounded like they weren't likely to do that and they may actually start phasing it out earlier. Okay, and what are you hearing from people in New Jersey? Are, are they welcoming this news? Well, I haven't talked to too many parents, but um, you know, this was a big issue at school boards, um, it, you know, school board meetings, parents have been really up in arms. I suspect there will also be kids and families that will want to continue wearing masks. I mean, some of us are still wearing masks in crowded situations because it just feels more comfortable in this new world. But um, so, you know, I would hope that schools allow and encourage um, children to have some choice in that too, whatever the mandate is. Great, all right, well, thank you so much for joining us as always. Thank you, take care. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut have cut a deal on sharing federal transportation funding. Rhonda Schaffler has the details on how much New Jersey will get, plus all the spotlight on business headlines. Rhonda? Leia, NJ Transit is getting nearly $2.7 billion in federal pandemic relief funds. That, after the governors of New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, reached an agreement on how to divide up $14 billion in COVID-19 transit aid following months of negotiations. New York is getting the lion's share close to $11 billion. New Jersey had been seeking about a billion dollars more than it received, according to reports. The funding will allow the transit agencies to cover revenue losses that occurred from ridership declines. There's a lot of work to be done in the state and the lame duck legislature only has a few weeks left, but yesterday lawmakers began considering dozens and dozens of bills, some of which landed on Governor Murphy's desk. One of the bills he signed would provide more money for job training at a time when companies in the state are struggling to fill open positions. The legislation would provide $3 million to the New Jersey Community College Consortium for a basic skills training program. The NJBIA says this comes at a critical time when workforce development is needed. How to address climate change and reduce carbon emissions is the key theme of the UN's Convention on Climate Change or COP26. And one New Jersey executive is part of the conversation. Ralph Izzo, the CEO of Public Service Enterprise Group is one of just a handful of US utility CEOs attending the conference in Glasgow, Scotland. In the past, COP was about government negotiations. There are 50,000 people here by some estimates. Only 1,000 of them are involved in negotiations. The implications of that are that businesses and not-for-profit organizations and other interested citizens aren't waiting for government. This planet is in trouble. The direction we need to go in is clear. The pace varies depending upon where you're from, but there's no question as to the direction. And businesses like PSEG, who've said we're going to get to net zero by 2030, are taking matters into their own hands. ISO says one way PSEG is doing that is by reducing emissions from its power plants and investing in renewables. PSEG Foundation is a funder of NJ Spotlight News. Now here's the latest on the federal vaccine mandate that an appeals court has temporarily blocked. The Biden administration last evening asked the court to lift the order that prevents the law from going forward, claiming lives will be lost without it. Meantime, the administration is urging businesses to move forward and make sure their workers are getting vaccinated, regardless of what's happening in the courts. Now here's a check on stock trading for today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by NJTIA's New Jersey Conference on Tourism, December 1st and 2nd at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. Event information online at njtia.org.
More than two months have gone by since Tropical Storm Ida devastated New Jersey. Businesses, homeowners, and schools are still recovering. Among them is Creskill High School, which experienced such bad flood damage that students can still not return after losing a year to the pandemic. However, the district found a new temporary location so students could get back to in-person learning. And one large company is stepping in to help them recover. Correspondent Joanna Gagas has that story. We still have not ordered the boilers or the univents because we don't have the funding. And without those heating units, middle and high school students in Creskill, by law, cannot attend school in their building that was devastated by flooding from Hurricane Ida. What people don't get is FEMA is a reimbursement grant, so they will give you up to 75 percent, which we've been cleared for, but we have to buy it and we don't have $19 million. I can't just go out and ask a bank for that money. Um, we have to go out through a bidding process. And that process, Superintendent Michael Burke says, takes months. Burke has been asking state officials for an exemption on the restrictive purchasing laws that require projects to be put out to bid. In this case, he says, it's adding a step that'll keep kids out of their classrooms for at least another three to five months. There has to be some way for us to be granted an exemption from the normal process and purchasing laws because the fact that we're sitting here two months after this happened on September 2nd and we still have not been able to order the essential parts to heat the building as we enter the winter months is unacceptable. In the meantime, students just yesterday were finally given the opportunity to learn inside a classroom setting at nearby St. Therese, a closed parochial school the district is now renting. But only two of their seven grade levels can fit in the building at a time, so the students will be on a daily rotation. But teachers at St. Therese still need to teach across grades and need to be able to reach the students at home. And the building had no technology, not even Wi-Fi. Enter LG. A lot of our students and families work. They have parents or relatives who work at LG, and they ask to help. So for LG to donate 12 75-inch ultra-high-def televisions is incredible because it allows us now to stream out of the classroom and the teachers to see their students who are home on a virtual platform. And the good news didn't stop there. At a press conference today announcing additional LG support. Today, I'm proud to share with you that we are going to donate another $25,000 to the school oh. district um, to Very really nice. help the, the community and the students in getting back into the classroom. The funds are incredible, and I didn't know about that. I was coming down here because of the televisions, which was beyond <laughs> generous. This leaves me speechless. Those kids got to get back to school, and, and we got to fight for it and fight for the money to get it done done. And the superintendent's been on the running point on that. And we would, not, we would not be here except for you today, obviously. Uh, headquartered right in Englewood, close one of my favorite towns. Uh, LG has come up big, great neighbor, and helping our communities in need. While this gift won't get kids back into their school, $25,000 could mean rent in a new building for two months or so. We're looking for other areas to possibly have students go to because if that happens, then we don't have to rotate as long. So if we can place two other grades in a different location, uh, we've looked at a temple, we've looked at other parochial schools, that then reduces the rotational time here in the building. Now we can bring people in once every three days. And while he continues to beg for the state's help, the Board of Ed last night offered some relief by passing a resolution to allow a referendum, asking the community to front somewhere between 16 and $19 million. 75% would be reimbursed to the taxpayers by FEMA and about 10% by the state. That could happen in January, which would allow students to be back in the classroom before the end of the year. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Joanna Gagas. And that does it for us this evening, but head over to njspotlightnews.org and check out our social platforms for the very latest stories impacting the people and communities of New Jersey. From our entire team, thank you for being with us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, 
committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. The Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Ocean Wind, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey.